Hi, welcome back to another episode of Real World Serverless, a podcast where I speak with real world practitioners and get their story from the trenches. Today, I'm joined by Ian Griffiths, who is the author of uh, Programming C-Sharp with O'Reilly, and he's also been active in the .NET community for a very long time. And uh, nowadays, he works as a technical fellow at the Engine. Hey, Ian, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, so I was talking with uh, Howard, uh, who is the co-founder of uh, Engine. Uh, you know, I guess I've known him for many, many years, uh, back when I was active in the .NET community. And I was, you know, both me and the Howard were big fans of uh, the, the aspect-only programming guys at uh, PostSharp. And um, so we were talking, and he mentioned that uh, you guys have been doing a lot of work with uh, Azure Functions. So I thought, uh, you know, i get you guys to come on the show and uh, talk about that, because uh, like you know, for me and for a lot of my listeners, uh, we are probably more heavy on the AWS side. And so I'm really curious about uh, how Azure Functions work and uh, how it differs from Lambda. Um, I guess before we dive into that, uh, do you want to speak, uh, tell us a bit, bit more about yourself and the work that you guys are doing at the Engine? Yes, so Engine, we're a, a fairly small UK-based consultancy specializing mostly in data analytics. So we, we build on top of things like Azure Fabric and Azure Synapse. And um, so the, the broad thrust of what we do is trying to enable people to exploit the power that's inherent in their data. So that's fundamentally what we do one way or another. And that obviously works through application of various technologies, including but not limited to Azure Functions. Yeah, and... Uh... Uh, and I remember you uh, saw, I think I saw a couple of talks that you have done at the various conferences around uh, optimizing code starts for .NET on the Azure Functions. Uh, but I guess um, you know, before we talk about the code starts, uh, um, is there any sort of, I guess, uh, interesting use cases that you've done uh, with uh, Azure Functions, uh, with Engine? Yeah, so um, we've made quite a lot of use of Azure Functions over the years. Um, so one of the standout ones for us um, was for a customer uh, a, a few years ago now that, that was doing monitoring of shipping internationally in order to discover things like illegal trading patterns or human trafficking or things like that. And it was all about analyzing large volumes of data that came in. And they were spending a huge amount of money on things in their data center to process that. And we moved them over to, we helped them move over to a cloud oriented approach for processing that. Um, with a kind of balance between frequency of processing and efficiency of usage. And we used Azure Functions as part of this. So there was essentially a recurring job that ran and uh, did batch processing to ingest and process data for them uh, to ensure that they were able to do the analytics they wanted in a timely way, but in a way that wasn't you know, hugely expensive to run. So I mean, it's not anything different from what you might do with, uh, with AWS Lambda. The basic idea is that you need to run jobs from time to time, which are typically triggered by internal requirements. So it might be timer driven things, it might be messages arriving on a queue, it might be uh, conditions being met somehow that trigger things to happen, it might be just communication within services that are not publicly exposed to the outside world, but where you just need a compute node to run some code on to get some work done usually for a fairly short amount of time. It might be a few seconds, it might be a few minutes, it might be a few milliseconds, but it's probably not gonna be hours or days in all likelihood. So it's, it's those sorts of jobs. Um, so yes, processing of that kind of data. We've also, um, actually an earlier thing I worked on, um, which actually ran on the predecessor of Azure Functions, which might be a useful thing to get into just to understand what Azure Functions really is and where it came from, was a system for spinning up virtual classrooms. So we um, uh, worked on a project where uh, people could essentially run labs where people needed access to machines configured in a certain way. So they could do hands-on labs as part of a training experience. And we automated the, the provisioning and uh, scaling up of large numbers of virtual machines. So students actually had machines they could go and do the labs on without having to you know, pre-install a whole load of stuff on their own laptops. Um, I used to do loads of training back in the day. And the way we used to do it was someone would turn up at the weekend and install software on a room full of PCs uh, ready for the Monday morning tra training to start. So this was automating that kind of work. And again, you need something that can sit and orchestrate a long running process and that can recover from failures and just push through and make sure everything happens. Um, and we were building that actually on the predecessor to Azure Functions, but it basically that developed into what became Azure Functions today. So yeah, orchestrations and recurring work and sort of internal processes, it's all those sorts of things. 
Okay. Is, I, re, I do remember reading about uh, something similar to on AWSI, you have uh, AWSI step functions, which is kind of the service that lets you uh, kind of build uh, and model your business workflows as a state machine. On the on, on the Azure side, I do remember there was something like, uh, was it um, Logic Apps? Was that, was Logic that? Apps. Yeah, that's it. Yes, yeah, so I, I would say they are a slightly different part of the Microsoft house. So, um, Microsoft has always had what we sometimes refer to as clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy type um, experiences, because uh, a large part of Microsoft's history is really empowering people to use computing in a way that used to require an IT department, right? Yeah, it's like a, a lot of the things Microsoft done were trying to put power in the hands of individuals, and they didn't necessarily invent the things that they did. Obviously, spreadsheets were already around before Microsoft brought them in, but Excel now is kind of, you know, it powers half of the financial world. And I think they're trying to do the same thing with Microsoft Fabric as well. And I think that the, for me, the Logic Apps fit into that low code, no code type approach where you're trying to enable someone who knows what they want to do uh, and can describe the process to be able to get that set up and put in place without necessarily having to be able to drive a compiler. Um, and I think these days probably Microsoft would drive people more in the direction of power apps and that kind of world rather than uh, logic apps. I see logic apps as being the kind of logical predecessor to that, but they were kind of connected to apps, uh, to the Azure functions world. So you're right, there's a connection there, but I, I, I see that as sort of, it's, it's more morphed off into a separate thing uh, from the app service world that it began in. Right, gotcha. So I guess in this case, uh, I've I've not uh, played around with logic apps in the past. I did uh, try out uh, Azure Functions uh, briefly, uh, and I know a few friends who's done some projects uh, using Azure Functions. And one of the things that kind of really stood out for me um, compared to AWS Lambda is the fact that uh, uh, it's actually using Docker under the hood, uh, and uh, you do I think it even exposes the, the underlying container instance uh, so that you can potentially um, you know connect to it yourself directly. Is there, I guess maybe, you know, can you talk, talk us through how does the Azure functions work and maybe how does it differ from Lambda? So one important thing to know is there's actually two different ways of using it. So yes, you can uh, use it in an explicitly containerized mode, um, but that's actually, as far as I know, that's only available on Linux. So if you build Linux containers, you can host them inside, um, inside the, uh, the world of an Azure function. Um, and, but that's actually most of what we've done has not been that way. We actually tend to, for historical reasons, have mostly built them on the Windows platform. Um, so there's a Windows version and there's a Docker Doc and a Linux version. They are the same API because you're writing .NET code in both cases and it's all .NET Core. It's just, are you compiling for Windows or Linux? Same source code could in principle run in either if you're avoiding any particular system calls. Uh, in the Windows one, it is containerized, but you don't get to see that, that you're using the kind of internal containerization system that Azure itself is built on top of, and they do not surface that to you in the Windows world. And they've actually changed what they do under the covers a few times. Um, none of the details of that are public, but the specifics of the containerization system that it's built on have not been the same throughout the entire history of, um, of Azure Functions. Whereas if you do use the Linux containerized version, then obviously it's a bit more stable because that is officially part of the public API and, and yes, you can talk to it. So with the Windows version, um, you can also kind of connect to it. You can get a command prompt into it. You can even attach a debugger to it and debug stuff up, up in Azure if you want to through Microsoft development tools. Um, that all works, uh, but that's all basically done over sockets. So you don't really know quite what you're talking to. And if you poke around on the machine from inside of a process running in, Azure, in an Azure function, um, it's sort of clear it's not quite a normal machine. It's, uh, it's some very specialized environment. Actually, let me give you an example of this. What one of the um, talk, one of the examples I give in my cold start talk is one of another thing Engine did with our uh, with with functions was badge rendering. So you know those little badges you get saying when things were last built or when they were published to this package repository. You see them at the top of readme's in a lot of GitHub repos. It will say you know this is the latest version. It will have a link to you know, you get or to PyPy or whatever, whatever package repository you're using. Um, and people tend to use, uh, they, yeah, there, are, there are public sites like Shields IO that will render these things for you. But we needed some of our own. We were doing some badges that actually represented 
um, IP maturity, maturity. So we're measuring things like um, how recently has there been a code review? Uh, does this conform to certain coding standards that are set up by the company? Um, various things of that kind for which there were no standard badges available. So we wrote our own Azure function just to render these things as SVG. Um, and we discovered that we had horrible startup performance when we first wrote this. It was like taking 20 seconds to get a response. And we couldn't work out why for a while because you run it locally and it's all like fraction of a second because it's just not doing anything terribly interesting. And the bit that we thought would be the slowest was all running you know, in under a millisecond. So it was, that was fine. The thing that was actually taking the time was reading font metrics. Uh, we were because we wanted to measure how wide the string was to work out how big to make the SVG for the badge. And it turned out the thing that was taking forever was loading the font description off disk because you're running on a headless server that, that never uses fonts. And so as the first person ever to ask for the font list, it turns out that just takes forever because on Windows, it does that very, very early on in the boot process. So the window, the font list is already cached by default. But on a headless server, it's like, oh, that's not a code path they've really optimized for. So, so that was a, a fun discovery about running up in that world is it's like, oh, it is Windows kind of, but not really. It's, it's like it has some quite different performance characteristics under certain circumstances. Uh, easily solved once you know the problem, but not that easy to work out that that was the problem. It was a non-obvious thing. Yeah, so speaking of uh, code starts, uh, is the uh, code starts as big an issue for Azure Functions uh, customers as it is for Lambda? Uh, with Lambda, there's a lot of people building, you know, uh, user-facing APIs uh, with, uh, you know, very different API gateway or some different options. Uh, but ultimately, when you've got a user that's uh, hitting your app and is talking to an API, uh, code starts, even for just a, more than a second is potentially a problem, especially when you've got you know API talking to API and all lambda function behind the scenes. So the code starts start to stack up. Is that something that you see people doing in terms of like building entire applications out of Azure Functions and you know having the problem with a code starts? It's it's a thing you you might need to work at. It really depends though on your usage model. Um, because there are different pricing plans with Azure and the performance you get depends on how much you're prepared to pay. So if your usage model means that you're going to be more or less permanently busy, then um, it makes sense to pay for one of the plans where you've essentially prepaid for a certain amount of compute that's always going to be available. And in those cases, um, generally speaking, even a cold start will be... Um, it, I forget the exact numbers, but it's 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 uh, it tends to be in the sort of low milliseconds numbers because they they pre warm instances up for you so that the amount of time it takes between a request coming in and your code running they work hard to minimize it because they can dedicate some compute capacity for that because you're paying for it right so whereas there is also a consumption based pricing model available where if you don't use the thing for three days you pay absolutely nothing. But obviously, in that case, they're not going to keep computers sitting, waiting for a request to come in on your behalf. And so in that world, there is a significantly higher delay. Now, you can still usually get it down to, um, you know, maybe a couple hundred milliseconds, which is which is not too bad for a thing that you've not paid for for weeks. Um, but if you don't design for that and don't test as you're developing, it's actually very easy to get yourself into a situation where it's much worse than that. And so, I mean, the example I gave of our little badge rendering thing, we did something that we didn't realize was going to have horrible performance and gave us like 20 second start times, which is obviously a t just completely unusable at that point. Um, but that's not normal. It, that, that was an, a, an unusual case. Um, so in practice, um, there are a few things that you need to do if you want to get the best out of the cold start performance. And it's not that different from AWS Lambda, to be honest. So one of the changes that Lambda made in their .NET SDK was they took advantage of the ahead of time compilation features that got added to .NET a couple of years ago, where rather than doing all of the JIT compilation, all of the translation from IL into machine language at runtime, which has been the default in .NET, forever. Um, you can now say, actually, I'm going to emit pre-compiled uh, machine language for a, the architecture I know I'm going to be running on in addition to the IL. And so the JIT compiler doesn't have to do anything at startup. The thing can just, just run immediately. And that often makes, you know, um, a sort of 100 millisecond type difference to startup times, possibly more depending on what you're doing. So for example, if you 
do dependency injection, it's very easy to write code that touches every single component in your system a teeny bit on startup as part of its initialization code, whether it needs it or not. And that can actually, you know, if you've got sort of 40 dependencies, you can suddenly be looking at start times of over a second very easily, whereas the pre-compilation technologies actually a very, do a very good job of flattening that back out to, to being, you know, acceptably fast, even, even for a full cold start. Um, but like I say, that tends to be the biggest issue with um, the cheapest plants, the ones where you pay nothing if you're not using it, because you really do have to start totally from scratch with those. Um, Microsoft has done a lot of work on the higher price points over the last few years to significantly improve the cold start in the case where you're prepared to pay a recurring fee every day to, to, keep, to keep the lights on. So in those situations, they do actually pre-warm things they load your code ahead of it being needed on new nodes. They don't bring those into service until it's ready. Because one of the features, um, for better or worse, of Azure Functions is that they assume you're okay with your code running for a long time. The basic assumption is you're probably going to start a process, leave it running maybe for hours, possibly days between reboots. Um, and so you're going to amortize most of those startup costs you're going to average them out to be very, very low because the overwhelming majority of your requests are not going to be cold starts. But the consumption-based pricing plans often change that. They often mean, well, actually, most of, your, most of your requests may well be cold starts because presumably the whole reason you went for that model is that you expect to spend large amounts of time idle enough that everything spins right down again. So it does depend on the usage model. So that's interesting uh, because uh, Lambda has also done very similar things uh, to what you described in terms of uh, having this uh, to -do, do pricing structure uh, on the Lambda side, they call it the provision concurrency. So essentially you pay for a number of instances of your function uh, to be you know, warm all the time so that you don't have to think about the cold starts. Um, but I think on Azure side, looking at the pricing page, um, they're not, um, charging you based on a number of instances, but rather based on v virtual CPU hours uh, and also by memory as well. So I guess that, that how does that translate to number of actual instances, you know, I guess stock instances of your function, um, say, you know, if you're, if you're paying for certain amount of vCPU, uh, is that, you know, if it's not like a whole unit, like one virtual CPU, do you just get like a fraction of the time uh, on that instance? It's not that clearly defined. They, they've deliberately left it a little bit on the fuzzy side. Um, and really, I, I could be wrong, but I have the impression that it's set up in such a way that if you're using it enough, that the charges are high enough that you need to know the details, that you're probably better off going on to one of the higher price points anyway. Because once you move on to the premium pricing plans where there's always at least one instance switched on it's a little bit easier to work out it does actually then translate more directly into a you have this many cpus there um, but it is a thing that we found difficult over the years is getting an accurate um well get, getting a complete pricing model for for, for customers um, i don't think we've ever had it be wildly wrong but it's often taken quite a lot of work to understand the workload the customer is going to present in order to to build the right pricing model in advance because it's not always that obvious what it, what it is going to do. So for example, um, we were surprised by the number, the, the extent to which Azure Functions is happy to scale out quite early on. So if you give it a sudden larger quantity of work, we were sort of expecting it to dump it all on one node to begin with and then gradually spread out. But it actually seems to be go into quite an aggressive mode of going, oh, you're busy, or I'm going to spread you across loads and loads of nodes. Um, but, that, but because you're not paying for the actual nodes themselves, you're really paying for how long your code is running uh, for any particular request. It doesn't actually make any difference to what you are charged. Um, but you need to know that that's happening in order to work out how to optimize the code. Because again, startup costs start to become significant there because if you're running once on a thousand nodes that looks very different to running a hundred times on 10 nodes right so so you need to you need to prototype and measure we have found to, to make sure that the, the characteristics you're seeing are the ones you expect so we spend a lot of time building sort of uh fake models of the real system and just timing them and measuring them and seeing seeing what the bills actually look like when they come in compared to what we thought they were going to, to make sure that we've properly understood how things are going to work. 
Okay. So in that case, uh, am I right in thinking that the, the same, the, no, it's the same as lambda in that uh, a certain, well, one instance of your function, once it's been provisioned and initialized, uh, it handles uh, one request at a time. So there's no concurrency with inside your function instance. Ah, no, you do get, you will get concurrency inside your function instance. Okay. Um, and again, once again, depends on which pricing model you've gone for. One of the pricing models is actually to do with where Azure came from. So, where, not Azure, where um, Azure Functions came from. So, Azure Functions is a part of App Service, which uh, is a set of technologies that um, Logic Apps was part of that. They also had a thing called Mobile Services, which might still exist, but I don't ever hear of people using it anymore. Um, but there's also web apps, a part of that. So if you deploy a web app, that's essentially the same infrastructure as an Azure function. And this comes from the roots of, of Azure functions is that the previous way to do the sorts of things you do in Azure functions was to create what was called a web job. So you would provision a web app, which you would allocate a certain number of compute nodes to. And you could also say, oh, by the way, I'd like to use those same compute nodes to run periodical jobs or to run things when things come in off, off queue. So you essentially piggybacked it onto an existing web app. And for a while, it was just it, call, it was called a web app, even if you were just using it for pure compute. And then over time, they separated that out into this distinct Azure Functions offering. But you can still use it in that old mode. You can provision what they call um, an app service, um, or either an app service environment, or you can have um, an app service plan, which essentially is where you're paying for some number of VMs at some capacity, um, and then you can then all your you can have several different web apps and several different functions all assigned to those compute nodes. And in that case, they won't they won't scale up or down unless you tell them to. And in that case, they will definitely be handling many concurrent requests. And so, so certainly the model for Azure Functions is absolutely capable of having very high numbers of requests in flight simultaneously if you if you let it. So there definitely isn't any requirement or, or presumption that it's one thing at a time. Okay, that's interesting. And I guess the, there's the pros and cons to, to that because that's one of the things that the, the Lambda team has uh, has resisted uh, up until now. And, and quite a few people uh, have kind of uh, commented in the past that, that they should introduce some kind of uh, you know, in-process concurrency model so that uh, you are able to reduce the number of code starts uh, so that you can have, uh, uh, I guess, also leverage some of the downtime you have in your code, in your function, so that when it's uh, making a call to some API and you're just waiting for a response, uh, you can handle another request in the meantime, um, and also reduce some of the, the, I guess, the amount of concurrency that, that you have to deal with uh, in your sort of Lambda at a service level. Uh, but they kind of, they haven't introduced that yet, uh, and instead they've been trying to focusing on reducing call starts, uh, you know, in, you know, instead, um, I guess the, one of the limit, I guess one of the downsides of having this uh, concurrency inside your function is that if one request uh, blows up, it's going to impact multiple requests. Any all the concurrent requests that's being processed at the same time is all is you know they're all going to blow up at the same time as well. Similar to how you have you know, that kind of problem when you have a you know, when you're dealing with a server. Um, is that that's something that the uh, you know that you guys have uh, have have found as well that uh, one. I guess in that case, so what model do you normally uh, prefer to work with? So um, what, one, thing, one observation I'd make is that because in the world of .NET, we've always tended to have this very concurrent approach. So if you go back even to the early days of the original ASP.NET back in 2001, even then the assumption was um, that you are going to have a single um, web server uh, that handles all the requests or maybe a small number of web servers that handles all the requests and it is all highly concurrent within a single process and so it's always been that way in the .NET world it's always been the assumption that you have long-running processes that do lots of stuff concurrently and multi-threading has always always been part of the picture so it's not really a new thing for Azure Functions that's more just it's it's carried on in that tradition if you like and part of that has been that um, there has been a tendency to try and keep errors fairly contained. So if you have something that blows up inside um, uh, a web request handler of some kind, whether it's a you know, web GUI or just a, a web service, normally it doesn't take everything else out with it. 
generally speaking, uh, the way it works is that the pipeline of handling that the process of the request just tr just tr handles that and reports a 500 error and and you just continue. So unless you decide that it's the kind of problem that indicates that the whole process is in trouble and you decide to do a fail fast, then the default behavior is it just carries on. Um, and that in turn is part and parcel of the idea that you probably don't care which machine you are running on. You know, if you don't know that you're on a particular machine, you've got a, a farm of servers and any single one of them could handle the request, then necessarily the request handling is going to be pretty self-contained. It shouldn't really be relying too much on process-wide states, because if you do that in a web app, you're, you've kind of made a mistake, because that's not how web architecture really works. It might, yeah, you, so, so you have to be able to work within the, the, the scope of a single request, and therefore failures tend not to have a particularly large blast radius. Now, some people probably look at that and go, that sounds horribly dangerous, because if something has blown up, what if it's actually destroyed some state somewhere else? Um, you know, what if it's made my cache invalid? And that's, you know, that, that is a reasonable um, point of view, but then you could also say, well, what if you've destroyed something in the database as a result of a failure going wrong as well? The, the answer is you have to use programming practices where such updates are atomic, and so either they succeed or they don't. Um, so it requires some developer discipline, but I think that's true no matter where your state is shared, whether it's with inside the process or whether it's a, a, a kind of more system scope. Um, but the reality is our experience is that it's not a big problem. You know, we don't tend to see, it's very, very unusual to see a problem where failures in one request have caused issues for some other part of the system that was running at the same time. So, so in practice, it seems to work okay. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of uh, multi-threaded uh, programming before in the .NET and uh, it's, you know, to get it to a certain level, I think, you know, get it to a certain you know, throughput and scale, uh, you know, you, can, you do have to do some certain things and uh, which uh, can be quite dangerous. Uh, we end up with a uh, deadlocks and other things like that. And also one problem that can, I guess, blow up the entire process uh, uh, is you know, to do with out of memory exception. Those, uh, those are not something that you can really quite catch um, in your application per se. Uh, but I guess uh, the, the Azure process may have some you know, safeguards in place so that uh, when it blows up, it doesn't just take down the whole server, but uh, the next request is going to reset itself. And I guess that uh, you just have a slightly bigger blast radius than you would do uh, than if you just one request at a time. Uh, it's not going to be you know, all of the application requests, uh, but it's just going to be a, hand, a subset of that. And I'm guessing the memory stuff, uh, is that something that uh, you have to set ahead of time when you configure the function to say how much memory um, is allocated with like you do with Lambda, or is it something that you just pay based on how much memory is, uh, is actually consumed in processing a request? So in the um, pre-priced plans, you are essentially paying for a certain amount of capacity. So um, the oldest approach where, you're, um, ha where you have a, a, an app service plan, as it's called, um, the number of CPU cores and the memory capacity are just part of the specification. So it's like you pay this much, you get this, you pay that much, you get that. And it's, that's very straightforward. Um, with the um, consumption-based model, uh, if I remember rightly, it's more than just a limit. They give you a certain amount of, amount of upper upper boundary, and if you go beyond that, then they'll just terminate the process. If you, if you well, that's not quite true. The garbage collector will try and stop you doing that, but if you genuinely try and use more memory than you have, then yes, it, it's, it's going to fail with an out of memory exception. Um, we were running quite close to the wind on that in the, um, the the application I described with the shipping stuff because we were doing uh, fairly complex computations to try and look at all the data at once in certain aspects to try and find uh, correlations of the patterns across the entire ocean um, so but it's uh, that's the only time I can remember where the limit became a major factor um, but yeah on the high volume things you, you tend to be going for one of the pricing plans where the where the capacity is explicit but uh, yeah for the consumption stuff uh, yeah I've, I'd have to go and look it up to be certain, but uh, yes, in, in practice, once you get beyond a certain spending level, it almost always makes sense to move off the consumption-based plan, the, off the initial consumption-based plans onto the premium plans anyway, which are you know elastic, but the, the capacities are more clear and the memory memory capacities are essentially prescribed.
Right, gotcha. And I guess, uh, do you on a, well? Do you do you also have this? Because you mentioned one one other thing that was quite interesting as well in terms of difference. You mentioned that the actual functions uh, there's uh, some built-in assumption that you're gonna have a long-running process as opposed to with Lambda. It kind of just assumes that it's one invocation at a time. You know, you, you can run for up to 15 minutes, uh, and then they actually have a quiet, uh, you know, a lot of processing behind the scenes so that they will garbage collect your idle instances so that. Uh, um, I guess they can reuse the resource uh, somewhere else for other functions or for other customers. Um, and I guess one of the benefits of that process, at least uh, for from my experience, is that uh, you don't really have any sort of you know, memory related problems like uh, memory leak uh, or memory fragmentations and things like that. Um, so on the actual side of things, uh, I guess there's no like background garbage collection that uh, I think on the Lambda side, if your instance is idle for like four to five minutes, uh, there's a good chance that you, it's going to get garbage collected. And even if it's busy 24 seven, it's you're going to get garbage collected after like eight hours. Uh, what's the behavior on the Azure side? So on Azure, <coughs> excuse me, if you actually go idle on Azure, if you go idle on Azure, you will tend to um, be evicted in practice. Um, so, well, so, certainly on the consumption base plans. I think even on the, um, the, the, the the Elastic Premium ones, I think they do actually bring new nodes online and then take old ones offline more frequently. Um, but you, but in, it, there, there's it's not documented exactly how long it will be. But empirically, uh, when I was doing the cold start talks, there, there were some clear thresholds uh, where things were obviously getting evicted. So um, there's a very simple one of just how long it takes before the connection gets shut down. So obviously, if you've got a HTTP connection already open, um, you avoid the handshake for subsequent requests there. So within a certain time window, um, you can just see that the, the average timing is is better because it hasn't had to reopen the connection. And then I go over about a minute and a half, that thing goes away. But then there's another threshold, 20 minutes, where you can see that the response time is significantly better if you your, your requests are less than 20 minutes apart. And then once you go over that, suddenly they get significantly longer if you're on the consumption plan because you've got fully evicted. So there is something similar going on. But the difference, I think, is that if you are permanently busy, so if you have a request coming in, well, not even busy, permanently active without ever going idle for a long time. So if you get requests uh, every five seconds, let's say, which obviously is not a busy website, but is a website that never sleeps, then um, you will remain in memory for significant lengths of time. Um, by inspection, it seems that it's not unusual to, to hang around for hours at a time. Um, I haven't attempted recently to work out if there's like an upper limit, if there's a time after which they will definitely boot you off one machine and move you on to another one. It I would expect there probably is, but I, I haven't attempted to discover what that is because it would require a long experiment. I'm not quite not sure how valuable the answer to that question would actually be to me. So, so I, don't, I don't know for certain, but certainly it's normal to hang around for hours at a time. That that definitely happens. Right, gotcha. Um, and what about the language support? Uh, I imagine it's, no, I think I've tried the JavaScript before. There's also obviously I imagine TypeScript as well and the .NET. Uh, what about the other languages and are there significant uh, performance differences in terms of code start uh, perform, uh, you know, for different languages runtimes? Yes. Yeah, so um, I forget the full list of language support, but there, there's basically two different modes. What one of which is it can effectively just run a command. And as long as that's able to accept incoming requests, um, it can then stick a front door in front of that that's able to route requests through to whatever your back end might be. So um, that's a slight oversimplification, but essentially that's how most of the runtimes work. So if you're running Node or even Python or um, something like that, effectively uh, you start up a process that's hosted in the, in the Azure um, Functions compute environment they then have um, a gateway that, that provides the, the public facing piece and that will forward requests to your back end so it doesn't really matter what you're writing it in as long as you can deploy something um, in principle anything could theoretically work um, and in practice they only install certain runtimes for you out of the box. So there's there's official support for .NET. There's official support for um, for Python and Node.js um, 
And so there's a, there's a few that they provide out of the box support for, but because you can deploy a container in the, uh, in the Linux version, then I think in theory, um, you could do all sorts of things in there. I've heard of people even like running just command line scripts as, as part of it. I think, I think that's a thing you can do. I, we, I don't think, I've certainly never worked on a system that's used that, but I believe it, I believe it is supported. Um, so one thing to be aware of is that up until, actually, well, still today, actually, uh, but uh, it's going to go away. So up until .NET 9 ships, uh, there's been two different ways the .NET code runs. So it's the, the, the default way for ages was for .NET code to be hosted specially because the Azure host process would actually load your code into its .NET world. It would essentially load it into, into its own process. So you were sharing a process with bits of the Azure functions runtime, uh, whereas almost all the other things worked with an out of process model. You know, the, the, the Azure runtime would talk to you through, through a socket and that was how you communicated. Um, and they've now supported both models in .NET. They have what's called the in-process model and the isolated model. And the reason they had the in-process model was that it enabled them to do certain things that were harder to do other ways. So, for example, the warming up of your code in advance uh, is easier for them to do if they've got some of their code in your process. And so that was initially done by saying, well, you are in our process. That is the model. That, that's how it's done. And so we're just going to load your, your libraries and then we'll call into them when we're good and ready. So you were very much some guest components in somebody else's server process. Um, they have now introduced, I say now, it was introduced a few years ago, but it's now become the preferred way of doing things rather than the other way of doing things. They have this isolated model where the Azure Functions environment connects to you via, I think, I think they use G, G, gRPC internally to, to, to connect, connect, connect to you and they describe the HTTP request that's come in but you're not actually talking HTTP you're actually just responding to incoming messages um, that tell you what the request was and you describe the response to come back out and then that gets sent back over gRPC to the gateway which then turns it into back into a real response for you so that's going to be the preferred model going forward they actually wanted to make that the only model for .NET 8 that shipped in November of last year but they had a last minute change of heart because no one was ready yet they've been telling people I'm going to take this away from you you're not going to be able to do the in process model anymore and people went la 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 can't hear you and so Microsoft really had no choice but to carry on supporting that for another version but they're saying they really are going to get rid of it for the next long term support version of .NET which will ship not this year but next year so um it's changing but yeah that that whole in process model was for a while kind of tied up with some of the performance characteristics of how things worked um but they've a part of the reason it's taken them a long time to migrate to this out of process model is because they've been trying to get performance parity and that actually will have improved the story for other languages as well because for quite a long time c sharp had a bit of an advantage because you got to be closer to the rest of the runtime whereas um now that everyone's doing this out of process model i think we're going to see better parity across the different different languages so yeah i i don't actually know the stats on how widely used um languages other than c sharp are in azure functions because it, it's always been a sort of a dot net first if you look at how it's been implemented i mean they very clearly support other languages and they, you know, they're, they're very keen to have people run anything on it but I, I was, I've sort of, from what I've seen in terms of how people use it, I think when people are doing things like uh, Node.js on Azure, they're more likely to be, to be running that in a container and using one of the containerization technologies rather than Azure Functions itself. But that could be skewed on experience that I happen to have had. Right? I don't have any kind of global stats on that. Sure. This, uh, that's, I guess that's interesting, the, the, whole, the, the whole hosted uh, process. And I guess uh, I can understand why they would do that for performance. But would that also create the security, potentially security concerns, uh, especially, I guess, uh, maybe the question is, uh, with uh, Lambda, they got this thing where on, the, on a given EC2 instance uh, that runs your Lambda functions, uh, there's no multi-tenancy. So your function is never going to be on the same host as uh, some other customers' functions. Uh, but you can have multiple functions uh, all running on the same underlying uh, hardware or uh, you know, virtual machine. Um, if you are able to, I guess, is, if it's, is it the same thing on Azure side of things so that, uh, so that it becomes safer for you to do this uh, hosted uh, process? 
So you're never going to be sharing a process with, an, with another customer. And actually, you're never going to be sharing a container with another customer either, as far as I know. Um, uh, my understanding is that um, when you are running your code in Azure Functions or any Azure App Service, uh, there is container level isolation. Um, obviously, you'll be sharing hardware because we know how these data centers are built. You know, there's racks with you know huge numbers of CPUs and a single piece of hardware, and we're all, unless you're renting, you know, 256 CPUs, you're probably sharing hardware with someone. So, um, but but with so to the extent that cloud computing platforms isolate at all, um, you are isolated. Uh, so really, the only the only concern for the difference in isolation levels between um, the in-process and out-of-process model with Azure Functions would just be a case of um, you can take down bits of the infrastructure that have been specifically allocated to you. But what's not happening is you're not running inside of their gateway. You're not running inside of the, the front end piece. You are still in a, a separate container that's just for your provisioned instance. Um, and yes, you're in the same process as the bit of the Azure Functions runtime that is on that side of the wall, but you're still very much boxed into a container. Right, gotcha. And talking about isolation, um, one of the things that the Lambda, the, the AWS teams have done in terms of uh, providing a stronger form of uh, isolation is that they created their own you know, Firecracker micro VM technology. And uh, talking to Howard, that's something that you guys are actually experimenting with. Um, I know you mentioned uh, before we, we started on the, the, the recording that uh, you are not act actively working on that. Uh, but is there anything you can tell me about the way you guys are looking at the Firecracker 4? You know, what's your use case? So we have a few use cases in mind. Um, so multi-tenancy is one that, that we keep seeing a, a lot. So we have customers who want to build multi-tenanted systems and there are always strong legal requirements around isolation of data. Uh, people often underestimate those. So um, we would like to see the, the Microsoft world move to stronger cross-tenant isolation. We think it would be, we, well, we think there is a tendency for it to be too easy to have a single deployed instance of a service that ends up with the keys to too many different kingdoms in it. It's not inevitable. There's nothing fundamental about how Azure is built that forces you to do this, uh, but it's quite easy to, put, to build yourself into that, you know, to paint yourself into that corner by accident. Um, and to be fair, Microsoft has been recently publishing some multi-tenancy guidance that helps make it easier for that. But um, we think that there is scope to kind of erect better boundaries between bits of the system. And we think that things, the interesting thing for us about something like Firecracker is it enables you to get a, a, a container-like boundary between places where it might not have been affordable to do that before. Because one of the problems we see is customers, you have large numbers of very small tenants, right? You might have hundreds of people who are paying practically nothing and a small number of very big tenants. And you're happy to dedicate you know, entire instances of your service to people who are paying you millions a year. But if you've got you know, a, a long tail, you, you can't just give everyone their own compute very easily. So we're very interested in how else can you enforce boundaries? And so that's, that's a reason that lightweight VMs, that's one reason lightweight VMs are interesting to us. Um, and also um, another reason we're interested just in Firecracker, but also oddly enough, we're looking at things like WASI as well. So WebAssembly system interface stuff. Um, we're interested in how can you minimize the amount that needs to be present before you can start running code. So obviously containers are a good deal more lightweight than virtual machines, which are a good deal more lightweight than ordering a new server from Dell and driving it to the data center. You know, it's better than it used to be for 30 years ago, but um, containers are still kind of heavyweight compared to what they could be. And so more lightweight things such as Firecracker, but also such as a, a web, web assembly driven model for separation and virtualization. Both of those are interesting to us in terms of just achieving better density. You know, how, how can you get more properly separated worlds onto a certain quantity of hardware without you know, flattening the whole thing? <laughs> 
Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, this, you know, I think you're probably the first per, uh, people that I, well, maybe the first one of the few people that I know that are actually experimenting with uh, Firecracker directly um, because it's a very low level technology. Most people just kind of you know, use it uh, through the, uh, using Lambda or it was uh, Fargate. Um, well, I think that's the thing we tend to do at uh, NG. I mean, I, I used to write device drivers for a living. That's how I got started in my career. Is I, I wrote kernel mode device drivers for networking cards um, and then wrote embedded software that operated inside of broadcast systems and so uh, I've always tended to be quite close to the metal originally in my career and so um, I tend to think that there's often value in looking at how things work at that lower level because you can see if you see things how they really are you can see opportunities for for composing things in other ways than the obvious ways that can actually enable better efficiencies or you know, better security within the constraints that you're operating under. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why we do these experiments. We think that it's, um, it's, it's useful to, to think, well, how could things be different than they are? Because if you just accept the defaults, then you're going to be doing the same as everyone else. Um, so in that case, so in your experience, uh, what has been the biggest uh, challenges with uh, using Azure Functions? The biggest challenge I would say with using Azure Functions has been the fact that it's a black box. You don't know how great chunks of it work. Um, and actually, lots of it has changed over time. So, and again, going back to these talks I've been doing about how to improve cold start, one of the interesting features of that is I rerun all the tests each time I deliver the talk, and often things have changed. Uh, even though I'm deploying literally the same compiled output that I was deploying three years ago, I, you know, it's just the same files pu pushed up there and the behavior is just different because they've changed something, usually with a view to improving something. So um, a lot of the changes in recent years have been specifically geared towards better cold start, in fact. So things just got better all by themselves without me changing anything. But the downside of that is that when things go wrong, it can be very, very hard to know where to look um, because it's by design, it's platform as a service. You know, you're not given a, a VM, so you can't do all the things you might normally do to diagnose problems because you just can't run arbitrary commands on the thing. You can't just install whatever on there and take a look at it. You don't have access to significant parts of the system. So for example, uh, one system we built, um, was using the security features built into Azure Functions. So there are means of doing service-to-service -service authentication. So um, you can basically have Azure itself impose a requirement that on only certain identities can call into certain functions. Um, and that's, that's quite convenient, but it's also completely unclear how it works. Um, and we eventually discovered that um, the scalability of that feature was less than the overall scalability of Azure Functions as a whole. So you could create situations where authentication was your bottleneck. And it wasn't at all obvious that that was the root cause. It was only of a series of kind of A, B changes that we revealed, oh, okay, if we just disable authentication, this whole problem goes away completely. Obviously, you can't do that, but we, that, was, that was the thing. And, we, and it was weird. What we were seeing was just inter-service requests were gradually taking longer and longer and longer. And we worked out that we were sitting in some sort of queue inside of some component of Azure Functions that we had no control over that was basically saying, oh, you need to be authenticated, right? I'll get to you in a minute because there's a huge long big list of other ones I've got to work on as well. And the amount of compute that they had provisioned for things like just signature validation, uh, you could overload it if you were doing requests too quickly. And it took us way longer to work that out than it should have done because you just couldn't actually see any of the moving parts it's like you're doing x-ray crystallography you know you're sort of throwing things into a black box and trying to see what pattern emerges from the other side it's it's hard um to actually understand what it is you're really seeing so yeah that is probably the hardest thing although i would say developing better relationships with microsoft certainly helps with that because if you know who to ask then you can short circuit a lot of that work <laughs> but in the, so it's, it's, it's got better from that perspective. Although, again, it depends on when people move from one team to another. Sometimes we lose our contacts and then it gets harder again. But uh, yes, it's, uh, I think it would be much easier if, you, if we could see more about how it's implemented. But I know why they don't do it, because they change things, right? So, uh, and they've talked about this. They, they've changed completely 
how the front end pieces work. Um, so back in the day, I think a lot of it was based on some modified version of IIS. You know, their, their old Windows web server was, was part of it. You can still see vestiges of that from some of the logging that's in there. Um, but they've now moved over a lot of these features to YARP, their new reverse proxy .NET based thing, because that gets, because that they can do things, more things more efficiently with that. Um, and they couldn't really do that if they had made the guts public because then you could take dependencies on how it works internally and then they can't change how it works and obviously that's that's a problem so i see why they do it but it is it is a downside of any platform as a service proposition yeah that actually makes sense uh, you know like we talked about earlier how the hosted process uh, does already have a course causing an impact in terms of what they can do uh, on the .NET platform itself and how the uh, how the hosting process uh, can work and uh, they have to push back a whole version of .NET to introduce some changes that they really wanted to do um i can imagine if you know they, they made more of it public then the people is going to just be depending on those uh, implementation details that they really shouldn't uh, but you know once they know it of course they will <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think they they made it pretty clear you're not supposed to do that. And I think they have put barriers in place that means that you realize you've shot yourself in the foot early if you do that. Um, but it tends to be more just things don't work. If you try and take advantage of some internal detail, it will just not work. The lack of transparency is much more of a problem for diagnostics, because when things go wrong, you just need to know what's actually happening. And if you don't know even the shape of the system you're looking at, that just makes it quite a lot harder to, to do. Ian, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk to us today and uh, for sharing your experience on the Azure functions and how it works under the hood. Um, before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Any things that the engine is, uh, is, is doing? Are you guys hiring? Any, anything that you really want to share with the, the audience? So the thing I most want to share is something I spent a lot of the last year on is uh, the beginning of last year. So just over a year ago, we took over the maintenance of a project called the Reactive Extensions for .NET or Rx.NET. I so love that project, our, by the way. Uh, yeah, I, I love it as well. I've been, I, yeah, I've, I've loved it since the day they first launched it. And um, it, it's, it was an amazing invention from Microsoft. And then it took the non -micro, bits of the non-Microsoft world by storm, you know, so it's, it's hugely popular in the Java, in bits of the JavaScript world. Yep. And then kind of, it sort of lost its way a bit in the .NET world. It became this open source project and then it never really had a great deal of official support. And uh, various people kind of had to move on in other directions and it sort of ground to a halt. So we actually volunteered to take it over. And so we've been bringing it up to date and we're trying to fix a bunch of uh, issues that, that have affected certain use cases. We've also written a free, well, I've, I've written a free book, uh, which is an update of um, uh, a book by uh, Lee, I forget his surname, that's embarrassing. I should have prepared this before I started the talk. But there's a book called Intro to Rx. Um, my co-author's name is on that. And it's a free book available for all that completely describes Rx in great detail. Uh, being done hand in hand with our kind of resurrection or of the support for that excellent project, which I think deserves to live on and we're helping it to do that. Perfect. Yeah, that's really appreciate that because uh, I was a big fan of Eric Meyer and his work and, uh, yeah. you know, you know done that, uh, well, back, back when, when I was in the .NET world and uh, Alex uh, and Alex.net came out, uh, it was a big thing for me. I spent a lot of time playing around with that. And I've been using the, the, the reactive extensions for uh, JavaScript as well. Um, so if you send me the link uh, to your uh, to the book, I'll make sure that it gets into the description as well. So anyone who's uh, reading and can uh, can go and learn more about this uh, reactive extensions for .NET, which is an amazing library, uh, something that's uh, super 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 cool to to see you know, being revived and uh, in, in the .NET world. Um, so yeah, Ian, thank you so much again. Um, and if uh, people want to find you, how can they find you on the internet? Uh, so if you go to engine.com which is the, the homepage of, of, my, of the company I work for. Uh, there is a who we are section and you can find everyone who works there, including me listed there. You'll find my blogs there, videos I've written and so on. Uh, or if you go to intro to rx.com, that's, that's the book. So I, I will send you the link as well, but intro to rx.com, that will take you to the rx bits and you can sort of find me through there as well. Excellent. So I've got those. Thank you very much links. for having me on. Yeah, thank you so much. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye everyone. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye.